our speakers, and um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you citizen power moment. There's two citizen power moments. The first one is the air conditioner. <laughs> we can tweak it down just a fraction, because I think it's got a little bit warm, but I'll take a citizen power vote on that one. We happy to go down just a tweak? The second citizen power moment is about the, um, what we're going to do in our speed dating. So I've got a few sticky notes here. We're going to send these around. I'm going to find my helper who's going to quickly spread these around. And between now and quarter past one, you're going to have a little think about what are the big questions you want an answer to. Because that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to assemble together after lunch in eight separate tables, eight different topics, and then you, the speed dating is ring the bell at the 10-minute mark. You will get up and change tables and go to the next topic, and our facilitators from the committee will be on those tables to They'll stay where they are. They'll keep talking about the same thing, but there'll be a new group of people and join them for the topic We've got a little list, and I'll just um, quickly give you a hint of some of the things that we thought about, but we're not bound to it because this is citizen power, isn't it? Um, so some of the things is, who is, your, who is your chair and the merits of a consumer staff or board chair? How to recruit new members for your committee? How to widen representation to include youth and young adults? Uh, what sort of training capacity do consumer members need? How do the committees use subcommittees to help them in their work? Dealing with difficult members. Uh, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Health literacy, and um, Nikki talked about that, and, um, and how to have input in running a health service. So I'll send my help around, and um, she will distribute the little... Uh, a few, just tear them off as we go, Shirley. David, you were there as well. And, um, and we'll distribute those around. But, doesn't matter. It, it, there's, no, there's no merit in the colours. What I'm going to ask for our next seven minutes, I'm going to ask one representative of our, of our three groups to come up the front. I'm going to ask Nikki to come up the front. And um, if you've got any burning questions about all the stuff you've thought about, because I'm looking over here, and do I see lunch? No. No. So we will keep asking questions until I see lunch actually land on those tables. And uh, so we've got Nikki. I think Peter's coming up and represent Alpine. Uh, Kerry's going to stand up because um, she was the only speaker in your group. Or you can't... You're, you're out. <laughs> Yeah. And um, Rita's coming up. Peter's coming. Are you coming, Peter? And I lost a microphone. So if Margo can, put up your hand, Margo, use the microphone, and I'll let you with our group. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm Anna from Beechworth Health Service. This is a question for GB Health. Um, I really liked the idea that you had about the award for patient-centred care. And I wanted to know, I think you said that you look at the um, patient feedback to, to determine that. Are you able to identify particular staff members from that feedback? And how do you do that? Uh, Yes, could Wendy answer this one because this has been Wendy's baby since in her time of being chair. <laughs> yeah, yes, you can. Um, very often people's compliments just say, oh, everybody was terrific, which doesn't give you much information about who was really good. So we're in the process of trying to encourage the staff 
to encourage their patients to be more specific. If you, if you want to write about us, say what you're thinking, because it's a, in a sense it's a health literacy stage. We want people to understand what they're actually grateful for. But so I, w I work personally would like the award to be to an individual, but sometimes it turns out that it's to a department, because if a whole department's been getting lots of compliments, then maybe the whole department wins. And at the end, last year's annual general meeting, a department got it and they put the money to the awards their Christmas party. So, <laughs> does that answer your question? Um, one thing we're actually looking at doing is specifically asking the patients on discharge if there's a staff member or person they'd like to recognise that's helped your care and why. Um, and that's something that we actually saw done at another hospital and we thought that would be great to actually get compliment numbers up but also recognise staff members who go above and beyond um, in addition to that. I uh, just wanted to ask Kerry about your role. It sounds like you're the resource officer that a lot of health services have. We don't have one, but it sounds like um, you've been there since the start. And it wasn't called a resource officer then, but it was called community development team leader. So it could just, obviously, you had a bit of a jumping start or a a start on everyone else as far as having someone that was able to do a lot of uh, grunt work for the group. Oh, thanks for the question. I think if you don't have a designated role, it will just um, fall to the bottom of the to-do list. It needs to be prioritised very highly and our board and our management prioritised it highly and made it a specific outcome they were looking for. We want a group and we want it to be diverse and we're going to hand it to you and we'll work with you to help it happen. And that was where we got Cathy McGowan involved. She was a, a rural community development worker back then and she just helped us look at our community differently. And I remember her saying then, community is like a weft and a weave. The worst thing you can do is create knots. You just make sure the work you're doing is going to fit in with your community and you bring them with you and you create beautiful patterns together. You don't come in and start reorganising things. So I think getting a, a shared philosophy between the board and management and then uh, designating a role, paying someone to do the job means that they, it's their responsibility to do the work. So it's been a really exciting part of my work actually and then it matches with health promotion so in a way I find out what the community wants and then in health promotion you get to deliver some of it so does that answer your question? I think you need a designated role. Can I add to that from Alpine Health's point of view as I said in my address we've been going 20 years and for the first I think it was four or five years we didn't have a, a designated person within the organisation so it went along with one of the nuns coming along to check uh, or to be at the meetings. And um, uh, we, I think about 2001, 2002, um, uh, a person was appointed and that's great. And I see that as a, an absolute essential part of the, uh, the organisation because that person in our case, it's Kate Duff, who's our community participation officer. She's employed point six at Alpine Health. Uh, and one of her designated roles is as the executive officer to the CHAGS. And uh, she does all the follow-up work and, and um, you know, produces the documents and they come to us and we look at them and it's really, really important. It wouldn't operate without that person. My, um, I'd like to compliment all three of you on giving us a great example of a successful consumer advisory committee. Um, and you've all said, amongst other things, um, certain qualities make it more successful. 
I'm particularly interested in knowing what time each one of you have your meeting, because it was raised by Goulburn Valley that the timing of a meeting determines who can participate. And I'm particularly interested in knowing what sitting fees are paid. In our case, um, <coughs> we've tried a variety of times because that's one of the other challenges because the time of the meeting often determines the type of people who can come to the meeting. Obviously, if you have it in the middle of the day, uh, certain people can't come. Um, within Alpine, I think Myrtleford and Mount Beauty do meet in the middle of the day. And Bright, we were meeting in the middle of the day and we changed that about three years ago to 9.30 in the morning. Uh, we've talked about possibly having an evening meeting, but then that often precludes people with children and that as well. So wherever you go, you're going to preclude a group of people. And as I say, it's a, just a constant challenge uh, looking at that issue of time and, and the diversity of the people on the, on the group. We have a 0.6 uh, EFT for our community participation officer um, and the, one of the major aspects of her role is uh, as executive officer for the CHAG, but we don't have sitting fees. Well, at Golden Valley Health I have experienced the same things with times. I remember when I first was chair, I was also at the school, so um, I had to leave school at 3.35 to be at the meeting at 3.45 and it went till 5 o'clock. So it was really, really difficult. Um, we now meet, we've, very, we've become exalted really. We now meet in the boardroom at 12 o'clock so it can be a lunchtime meeting. We have lunch provided so we are very, very well respected I think throughout the Golden Valley Health community. But that hasn't been without a lot of hard work from our resource officer to find time in the boardroom. Uh, it also means that we can have an hour after our meeting so that um, we can then bring in people. But that's also another challenge of where you can bring in people from various uh, areas across the services so that they can come and talk with you about their work. Our setting fee was placed at $50 um, at the beginning, I think it might be 55, 60, 60, and it's never changed in 10 years, so there you go. And that has been budgeted by the, it's under the Quality, Margot, Quality Union, and that is budgeted within that budget. Sorry. Uh, sorry. to resource officer one day a week and if you don't attend that meeting you don't get paid. I mean that's that's a reasonable thing to think about too. I mean that's not fair to the organisation. Yes. We meet once a month, uh, 10 meetings a year, minimum of 10 meetings a year. Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. So that gives us another dimension, doesn't it? Mm. That would have to be worked out with your board, I would think, somehow. I was just thinking about the 11th, I mean, even Bright, they've got 15 to 20 per meeting, or 24 sometimes. Mm. Thank you. 
Oh, Mr. Video. Okay. Islands in the stream. Oh, okay. Um, was um, was that whole thing about um, sitting fees, reimbursement of expenses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the guideline that was that was developed by the Victorian government a million miles ago, a million years ago, if you read those guidelines about community advisory committees, it stipulates a few things very clearly about sitting fees. And what's happened over time is that a majority of our sector have chosen to ignore that for a whole range of reasons. So it's one of the things that when... Um, the guidelines are being reviewed very heavily, especially from the consumers that have been involved in those conversations so far, was that question. And I think one of the things... I have my own very strong opinions about this, as you can imagine. But I think that one of the things that we have to think about with sitting fees, same as with meeting times and everything else, is how do we enable people to participate um, I know when I worked in community for years, I worked in Coburg, there were people at my uh, committee table, even, who genuinely didn't have a bus fare to be able to come to that meeting if they weren't supported to come. So, once again, this isn't just a matter of, like, you know, paying people for the sake of paying people. It's always thinking about what's equitable in terms of enabling participation. It's a tricky thing for health services because they're not given any resources at all to do any of their participation work, just expected to do it on top of running a health service. Um, but it is something that we need to not keep going, it's too hard, it's too hard, it's too hard. We actually need to think about it and address it. And Goulburn Valley are one of the few health services I've ever met um, who I think have actually done that very well. Well, I'm just conscious that if we want lunch, we probably have to draw a line in the sand on the questions. But these people are here to talk to. Kerry, you're going to answer a question. Oh, OK. The answer is we did Monday nights at 6 o'clock for about 10 years with a beautiful meal. We always start with a meal. We think we at least can reward our volunteers with um, hospitality. And then we've now moved to a Thursday lunchtime, 12 till 2. And once a month with lunch. Um, and under the CAG guidelines, we're actually going to reduce our number of meetings per year. But in the past, we did about 10 or 11. And there was a significant resource to CAG? Oh, point two. Yes, one day a week. Look, I'm going to hold the questions because we've got plenty of time for discussion after lunch.